Hello and welcome to Gardening at 58 North. So this is part four of my sunflower series about how to grow the biggest sunflower possible. And this video is all about the care over the summertime once your plant has got established and just how to look after it as it grows over the summer. So the key thing for the sunflower at this stage is stress. You want to reduce the amount of stress as much as possible. Basically when a sunflower gets stressed, it will start flowering earlier and the earlier the sunflower starts to flower, the less tall it will grow. Basically sunflowers grow until they flower. Once they start flowering that's about the maximum height they will get as they stop growing leaves and they just put all their energy into the flowers. So the key thing for getting the tallest sunflower is to get as much leaf as possible such as this one is here and just to delay flowering for as long as possible. So the main ways to reduce stress at this time of year is plenty of watering. If it gets drought stressed at all it will just make it flower. You also need to make sure the temperatures are correct. Now, depending where you live, most places in the world in the summertime will be plenty warm enough, so we mainly trying to avoid the maximum heat. So if it's really hot, like 40 degrees Celsius, or really anything over 30 or 35 degrees Celsius, is a little bit warm for it. What you can do is try and shade it at the hottest time of day, or even have some kind of a misting system just to keep it a little bit cooler. Other things you need to bear in mind is the feeding. It needs to be well fed at this time of year so it doesn't get any nutritional stress. You also need to worry about physical stress from wind damage and also any weeds as well which might compete for its nutrition. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is what your sunflower should look like at this stage, what a healthy strong growing sunflower looks like and that way if you have several of them and you don't know which one is going to grow the best and which one you need to put the most attention to I can just give you an indication of which one has the best potential to grow to an absolute giant and which ones are probably just going to stay a bit smaller and not get to that record breaking size. So one of the first things you want to look at is leaf size. So as the plant grows each leaf should be bigger than the last up to a certain extent. Once they really get going they don't really get much bigger the leaves. But if I pan down you'll see here the first few leaves are quite small and each leaf that came out got bigger and bigger and bigger until it got to its optimum maximum size which is probably around about this size here and then you can see the leaves haven't got much bigger but what you're looking for particularly at the younger stage about a month earlier than what this plant is at you're wanting to find every leaf getting larger and larger like that and I'll show you some other sunflowers now which don't have that effect. So with these ones you can see every leaf has got larger that's what you're looking for the bigger the leaves the more photosynthesis it, it can carry out and the more energy it's going to gather and the less likely it is that it's going to go into flower. If the leaves aren't getting much bigger what it means is it's not really getting its roots established it's not sizing up and it's going to remain quite a small plant. So over here I have a couple of sunflowers these are not showing optimum results the reason being there's a, there's a hedge here it's taking up a lot of the water and the nutrients so these are a little bit stunted and they're not getting quite as much light as they need. So you can see with these ones the leaves they're not much bigger than when they were younger they are getting slightly bigger but as again they're not much bigger than my hand quite small leaves this one shows it particularly well you can see the leaves are staying quite small not getting that big so these ones are not going to grow to their full potential and are not going to become giant sunflowers. And when looking at the plants as well what you're looking for is a good leaf colour. So these are actually looking quite good at the moment because I have fed them they're nice dark green colour. You're looking for the darker green the better pretty much so this one here is a particularly nice dark green colour but that might be because it's getting to the flowering stage but ideally the darker the leaves the better if they're a pale green it means it doesn't have enough feed it's a little bit stressed the paler the leaf the less chlorophyll's in the leaf and so it can't photosynthesize as efficiently a dark leaf will absorb more of that sunshine so a light leaf will reflect more of it or more of it will pass through the back of the leaf so the darker the leaf the better that means that it's a really good healthy plant and you can see in this one here my main sunflower which is doing the best it's got really nice dark leaves at the moment all the way up the stem whereas I have one over here which is a little bit stressed um, because it doesn't have enough space for its roots and it's in competition with a rose shrub and you can see in that the leaves are much lighter than leaves on the big one behind so the lighter leaves is an indication that it's struggling a little bit with feed and it's, it's not got its roots uninhibited. If it has lighter leaves it's not enough feed and the roots are inhibited by something else such as weeds or other shrubs. So another thing to look at is stem thickness. Now the stem will thicken up pretty quickly even as a young plant so if you, you're noticing the stem is getting thicker and thicker that's a fantastic sign. So you can see in this one for example got a really nice thick stem and one example that it's suddenly growing much better than it was previously is the stem at the bottom is slightly thinner than the stem further up so if you're starting to get really thick stems appearing 
that means it's taking off, it's doing really well, and you just want that stem to keep thickening as it grows. If it is a lot thinner at the bottom than the top, what it means is you had it slightly stunted when it was younger, and when you transplanted it, it's doing better than before. This will reduce its eventual size, so ideally that means that you should have planted it in the ground a bit earlier, and it's not gonna to get to its full potential because that narrower stem at the bottom is constricting the sap flow slightly. Now that will grow thicker, but it will just struggle a bit because it has been constricted. So slightly thin at the base means that you are, it's actually starting to take off and do much better. But if it's too thin at the base, that means it struggled a bit early on in the year. So this one, as I say, could have got maybe bigger than it's, it will eventually get to, but it's, it's looking pretty good. Stems thickening up nicely, growing nice and thick. And even towards the top, even though it narrows, that is still thickening that stem and it's still fairly thick for the size of the plant. Whereas if you look at some of the more stressed plants, you can see here, the stems are quite thin. They're not really thickening up much. And the stem is pretty much uniform thickness along the whole length of it. So it's not getting any wider as it's growing. It's just kind of staying at that thin level. And a thin stem won't be able to support such a large plant. So another thing to bear in mind is leaf spacing and leaf number. So this is a pretty good example here. Now you want a kind of compromise between loads of leaves and good spacing. So the, th the thing is, you do want a lot of leaves, but you also want a reasonable amount of spacing. So if you have loads of leaves and the spacing is quite short, that normally means that you've got really good light levels and it's gonna be a really good strong plant. But if it doesn't have as much spacing, it means that it, it's not stretching to its full height potential. If you just want a giant sunflower, maybe maximum head size or maximum branching, uh, the, the, the smaller the spacing between the leaves, the better. It means it's got plenty of light, it's growing really happily, and you're gonna get big, thick, healthy stems like this. But for maximum height, you're not gonna get quite to the full reach that it could possibly grow to, just because the plant is a bit more compact. But generally, what you're looking for is a good covering of leaves like this. If it's looking quite sparse, such as these two plants here, particularly this plant on the left, there's not as much space for photosynthesis. It's stretching for the light, it's not doing as well you're not gonna get the biggest plant possible. So that's something else to look out for. You want to have loads of leaves on the plant. The bigger the leaf, the better. And you want them to be covering the plant nice and densely as well. So I'm now gonna cover the topic of, of watering more in depth. So when it comes to stress reduction, that's one of the most important things you can do in the summer and one of the easiest things to do as well. So sunflowers like this, they have a huge amount of leaf area, especially come mid, mid to late summer when they're really big plants. And the amount of root space they have doesn't match up entirely well. So if you have a really warm, dry spell, although some flowers can survive drought quite well and they won't die, they will get stressed and they will go to seed much quicker so you get a much smaller plant. So watering is really important. They're very thirsty plants and they have a really dense root system. So this root system of this plant here, it has the potential if it was poor soil or very sandy soil to actually grow several meters out in all directions. But the problem is if you allow the plant to do that, it's putting so much energy into its roots, it doesn't have as much energy to put into leaf growth. So what you want to do is encourage a much smaller, denser root ball. So you want to dig a big area when you first plant it up for, for the roots to grow into, but you want to kind of focus that into a smaller area. Now you will need to water in about a meter squared area of the plant, but you just want to make sure that meter squared area is always really damp so that it doesn't have to search further for for its nutrition. So a plant like this, or uh, any large kind of sunflower, you'd, you'd be expecting to need three to five liters of water every day per plant. If it's a really hot sunny day, or you've got some strong winds and it's low humidity, you might need to up that to more like 10, 20 liters a day. Or if you have cooler cloudy weather, you might need to barely water it at all. And of course, if you're getting regular rainfall and the soil looks nice and damp, you probably don't need to be watering. So the watering, as I say, it's very important. You will notice if you're not watering enough because the leaves will go limp. As soon as they start going limp, the plant is getting stressed. You're not gonna reach the full potential. Ideally, for the whole summer, you never want to see the leaves going limp, even on really hot sunny days. You just wanna keep it really well watered and really happy and healthy. This plant, for example, has never had any limp leaves the whole time it's been growing, and it's looking fantastic at the moment and growing really well. The other two plants I have over here, though, they have wilted slightly as they're next to that, that hedge and that's part of the reason that they've been stunted slightly. So next I'm gonna talk about feeding. Feeding is incredibly important at this time of year. If you want to get that absolute maximum size, you need to feed the power of this plant. And the main thing you need is nitrogen. Now, 
with sunflowers you want to get them as big as possible and as leafy as possible. The more leaves, the more photosynthesis they can carry out and the faster they will grow. Also giving them a high nitrogen feed, it tells the plant that it's doing well and it's got plenty of nutrients because in the wild nitrogen is one of the, the most important nutrients for plants and it's one of the ones that gets used up the fastest and is the least available later on in the season. So if the plant detects that the nutrition levels are getting a bit low, it will know it won't have enough energy to keep growing for the rest of the summer so it will divert its energy into flowering instead of putting on leaves because leaves use lots of nitrogen whereas flowers don't really need much nitrogen at all so making sure there's constantly a really good available supply of nitrogen will just make your plant grow much faster and it will really delay flowering and you can tell this plant has had good nitrogen levels for the whole time it's been growing because you can see along the whole plant it's got really nice dark green leaves now some of these leaves further down you might notice they do actually have a bit of damage on them. This is from the wind, this is an unnutritional deficiency. We had 40 mile an hour winds earlier in the year and that's what that's been caused by. But a sure sign that you've got low nitrogen levels is the leaves will be a little bit paler, but particularly the lower leaves down here, they will be going yellow and falling off or even completely dying back. So if you have lower leaves still attached to the stems, that's fantastic. It means you've never had any nitrogen deficiency its whole life and it's doing really well. Now you might find one or two at the very bottom die off and that's not always nitrogen deficiency. What can happen is the stem expands so much that the leaves have to get ripped off from the plant because when these leaves were first growing the stem was incredibly narrow and as the stem widens it actually rips off the leaves. So you can see here that stem has actually split in half there and that's quite a common thing to happen with the younger leaves. Same with this one here, you can see it's kind of splitting in half. So if the very smallest leaves at the bottom, like these ones, die off, don't worry too much. And a sore sign that that's not a nitrogen deficiency is they'll often just die off before they start going yellow. So if that happens, it's not a nitrogen deficiency. But if quite a few of the leaves start going yellow, and they're particularly towards the bottom, and they're going yellow and then dying, then that is a nitrogen deficiency and need to make sure that you give it a lot more nitrogen feed. So what I tend to do to make sure it's got all the micronutrients it needs is in the beginning of the year, when you're first planting it, give it a slow release organic feed. That will make sure that all the base nutrients are there. It's gonna have enough potassium and phosphorus as well to keep it growing. Because although nitrogen is the most important, if it's sort of any nutrients, it will stunt it slightly, but nitrogen is the most important one. So make sure it's got that base nutrients at the beginning of the year so that it doesn't have any of the other nutrients as a deficiency. Nitrogen is by far the most important one. So what I do is I just get a pure nitrogen feed. You can normally buy them from garden centers and I just liquid feed it in. The reason I do liquid feeds for the whole summer is because it goes, goes instantly into the plant. The liquid feed, it holds the, the nutrients in, suspended and dissolved in water. The plant can then take it up and it can take it up within just a few minutes. Within a half an hour or an hour, it can be up into the stems and into the growing parts of the plant. So it's an instant feed, gets the plant straight away, where slow release feed or a granular feed, they go in the soil and they slowly come out throughout the, the, the season. But when the plants are growing this fast, they're so hungry that they really need to feed instantly. So what you want to do is regular feeding every few days or once a week and you just want to keep it fairly high but not, but not excessively high so you're not poisoning the plant but they, they are surprisingly hungry feeders and along with the nitrogen there's a couple of other feeds that you need to add throughout the summer for maximum growth so when it comes to photosynthesis nitrogen is very important but for, for the chlorophyll it's also very important the plants have magnesium and iron as that's a very important process in the in the photosynthesis stage. So to get really dark leaves, you also need to make sure you got magnesium in. I normally do that as a, an Epsom salt. I get Epsom salt and I dissolve it in water. I water that in with the nitrogen, that works well. And as for the iron, you can also get iron feed as well, just a pure iron. Now you have to be very careful with the iron. The plant doesn't need much. Most soils already have quite a lot of iron in it, so you don't need to worry too much about getting some iron, but you just want to add a tiny bit, maybe every two weeks or once a month, to make sure that there is plenty of iron available. And the other problem with iron is it's very acidic, so just use it sparingly. You don't want to overdo it. If you overdo it with Epsom salts, it's not a big issue. If you overdo it with nitrogen, it can cause a few problems, but it's not too bad. If you overdo it with iron, you can definitely kill a plant. Or what you can do is raise the acidity so much in the soil that it can't absorb other nutrients. So just be careful with, with iron feeding. So that's the feeding covered. Um, if you want to really supercharge charge a plant, I've not done it with this one, and it's not always necessary but you can also foliar feed. So for foliar feed you want to get specialist feeds for that because if you overdo it with a foliar feed you will burn the leaves and the leaves will get damaged. 
the way that foliar feeds work is you get a fine mister and you mist a weak solution of the feed over the leaves. That gets absorbed instantly in the leaves. It doesn't have to go up through the plants or through the root. So if you've got a weak root system or the, 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 the soil has acidity problems and the plant can't properly absorb the nutrients, then it will just overcome that by going straight into the leaves. And you can do that daily if you want with foliar feeds. The only thing to watch with foliar feeds though is you don't want to do it when there's high evaporation or low humidity because it will just evaporate. It won't go into the leaves, it will stay on the surface and you'll get salt build up which will burn the leaves. So you're best doing that at night time and letting it absorb over the night. So the next thing I'll talk about is staking. Staking is very important. You really don't want to get any wind stress. If this gets wind stress, it could rock the roots. If it rocks the roots, the roots will get damaged and then that means it won't be able to absorb as much nutrients. Also, if the roots get damaged, it will go into shock. It will stress the plant and it will flower much, much earlier. So you want to make sure it's well staked to avoid any of that. Another reason you want to stake it is if the, the stems get moved a lot, what can happen is the plant will put on much thicker stems and it won't grow as tall. It will grow shorter but thicker stems and so you won't get that really tall plant. Now I tend to go for somewhere in between. If you want the absolute largest plant possible or at least the absolute tallest plant possible, you want to stake it really securely so there's no movement at all and that way it will grow really tall and leggy and you'll get a really tall plant. I find it quite difficult to stake it once it gets too tall. This one for example is already about two and a half meters in height and this will probably go up to about four meters by the end of the season. If I was to stake it securely, it could get up to five or six meters. And by that time, it's going to be so tall, I can't get any more stakes on it. It's going to be really difficult to, to look after. And because the stems will be thinner when it's securely staked, they won't be as strong and resistant to the wind. So I'll probably lose mine in my very windy climate. Come September time, I get really bad storms in my part of the world. So what I tend to do is I just loosely stake it. So beginning of the year when it's small, probably until about two or three foot, I don't tend to stake mine at all. That allows it to flex in the wind and it means that the stems are going to thicken up and get a stronger stem. Then what I do midsummer when it gets about a meter high to stop the, it flexing too much. When it gets a bit bigger it catches the wind more. So you definitely need that staking later on in the year. So I, I put on a loose stake so you can see here there's that bamboo cane. Now when you do stake it, what I tend to do is just use twine because I like the way that it biodegrades over time if you forget about it. But you're actually slightly better using a thicker string than this. The thicker the string, the less likely that it's going to dig into the stem. The problem with metal or wire or very thin string is it can dig into the stem and damage it. So you want to make sure it's slightly thicker than this and keep it nice and loose like this one is here. Because these stems thicken so quickly, you tie them around and within a week the, the stem could double in thickness and this um, string or twine could be choking the plant and reducing the amount of sap flow to it and that would really stress it. So make sure it's loosely tied. The other reason I like to loosely tie it is to allow flexibility. So you can see this one can still move around quite a bit but it can't move enough that it will damage it in the wind. So although it's moving in the wind, the wind can't damage it at the moment. So that's the perfect combination I find for keeping this plant nice and stocky and strong so it can survive the wind later in the year, but also giving it enough support that it doesn't get killed by the wind at this time of year. But as I say, if you're trying to grow the absolute tallest possible, what you really want to do is keep it really rigid to stop it from moving. But just beware that you'll need to check on the wires almost daily to make sure they're not digging in because they will thicken up so quickly. And when it comes to staking, I'm going to do probably a one-off video all about staking because there's several different methods depending on the type of the sunflower, if it's multi-stemmed like this one or if it's a single uh, flowering variety. But the only other thing I'll add about staking in this video is when you do stake it, try and stake it early so that you can have the stake in before the root system is in place because putting in the stake can damage the root system and you really don't want to damage the roots and also try and stake it away from the stem so you don't have too much damage from the, the stake rubbing against the stem. From when you're putting in the, the, the stake later in the season, if you've forgotten to put it in earlier, you're just away from that main root system at the base there, so you're not disturbing it too much. And when it comes to the roots, it's important to keep them very happy. If the roots are happy, the rest of the plants should be quite happy and it shouldn't go into stress too early. So what you want to do is make sure you've got a good layer of mulch. I've got some old composted bark here. What the mulch does is it keeps the moisture in. If the soil was baked by the sun, it would dry out quite quickly quickly and stress out the roots. It also protects it from any animals. I have a lot of birds in my garden which like to scratch around in the soil. This just gives that an extra layer of protection because if the roots are damaged it sends a hormone to the rest of the plant that tells it it's been attacked and there's been damage and it could just increase the stress hormones high enough that it might encourage it to flower earlier. So good layer of mulch, keeps the water in as well so it doesn't dry out too quick so you don't lose as much water for evaporation so your watering won't be as intensive. 
also protects it from the heat of the sun. The soils can get too hot, especially in countries with really warm summers or really sunny hot summers. So that just keeps the, the soil a little bit cooler. You don't really want the soil getting above 30 degrees, which is quite possible if you're in a warm climate. So it keeps the roots just at their optimum temperature. And along with the mulch, what you want to do is make sure there's no weeds. So if you have any weeds in the soil, the problem is the weeds will be trying to get water out of the soil and nutrients, and they'll be stealing some of that water and nutrients that would otherwise be going to the sunflower. So you really want to make sure that there's no competition from the weeds and you want to take the weeds out as soon as you see them. Now if you do have a deep mulch like this you probably won't get any weeds the whole season long. But if you do get weeds take them out as soon as you can because if you take them out as a small weed there's not going to be many roots. You won't disturb the sunflower roots much but if you allow that weed to get quite large and you have to pull out a big weed root system you're going to severely disturb the sunflower root system and that will cause a lot of stress. So as the season progresses I'll probably talk about this more later on in the year when it's more important but what you need to start thinking about especially with multi-stem varieties or varieties with multiple heads is you'll need to start deadheading them. So if you start getting sunflower heads and you, want, and you have a branch variety constantly take off any of the old ones just as they finish flowering because you don't want the energy to go into the seeds you want it to go into putting in new flower heads so just keep them well dead headed and I'll now talk about how to identify the flower heads so that you know that your plant is going to come into flower soon it's very important to know when it's going to come into flower because that way you'll know when to switch to a different type of feed and you'll also know which plant is going to become a giant and which one isn't so this one for example doesn't have any signs of flowering yet it looks like it's going to become an absolute giant and I'll, I'll show you why I know that so one of the things that you can tell is there's loads of new leaves coming up and they're all bunched up together so you can see there all I can see is stem after stem and these ones are quite close to each other but once they're fully grown they'll have a similar spacing to these so that gives me an indication of how much taller this is going to grow even if there is a flower head about to start but when they're bunched up like that it's much less likely that there's a flower head coming you can see loads of leaves coming it's looking fantastic so I know this is going to be at least a month until this is going to come into flower. This one here it's fairly obvious it's going to come into flower. What you get instead of leaves is you get these little bracts starting to appear and you, you're, this one is quite obvious because it's already forming a bit of a head there. So this one will be flowering within a couple of weeks so I know with this one I need to stop giving it nitrogen feed. It doesn't need all that nitrogen for its leaves anymore. It's going to stop growing leaves. It's going to put all its energy into flowering. So I would go with a high potassium feed such as a tomato feed and you want to do this as soon as you start seeing this. So this is actually a bit late to start giving it tomato feed but I would still be feeding it tomato feed at this stage. But the earlier you catch it the better because then you know that you can switch to um, tomato feed and not keep it with nitrogen otherwise you're just wasting the nitrogen and the earlier you give this the potassium the better because when the flowers are really really young that's when they determine their, their eventual size although they, they could determine their eventual size still as it's still forming the earlier you get that potassium feed in the bigger your flower head will be so earlier than this ideally swiss potassium so it's, so it's tomato feed and you'll get a much bigger flower head so this one here it doesn't look like it's coming into flower you can see it's similar to the, the first one i showed you there's not quite as many uh, stems bunched up together that could be because it's a weaker plant or it could be because it's starting to think about flowering but if i come down and have a look here there is actually a flower head forming so these will leaves coming out but you'll notice right in the middle there you've got these lots of little bracts so they're not the leaves are like this they should have lots of veins coming out the side of them the bracts for a flower will look like this lots of little kind of leafy bits but they don't have the veins coming out and they're much smaller so as soon as you see that this will be the perfect time to now switch to, to potassium feed there's probably already enough nitrogen in the, in the soil for this to still put out lots of healthy leaves if you're going for the tallest possible keep up the the nitrogen feed for longer but what I tend to do is I switch to potassium now because I like to enjoy the flowers and not just have the tallest possible. I also like to have big flowers. So this will be a perfect time to switch to potassium feed. There'll already be plenty of nitrogen in the soil. And so that will get ready for when it goes into its flowering phase. Now, if you've got a multi-stem variety and you want to get it really big and you want to have loads of flowers over the whole season, I would keep up the, the uh, nitrogen feeding for a lot longer. So this one here, for example, is a multi-stem variety. At every leaf junction, I've got a new stem coming out. So say, for example, this was starting to flower at the top and I gave it a potassium feed. What would happen is it would put on a really good flowering display, but it would stunt these side shoots and they would uh, have slightly smaller leaves and start flowering possibly slightly earlier. 
and what these often do is they send out a very long suit. This suit could be as big as even some of my smaller sunflowers. It could be up to six foot in size and these leaves could eventually potentially get as big as these leaves. They are normally a bit smaller but with enough nitrogen and looked after properly these can become as large as some normal sunflowers and these will even start putting on side suits. They haven't started on this one yet but you can see there's absolutely no sign of flowering on this so it's going to continue growing well without any flowers for a while and these side suits what they'll start to do is I'll put on their own side suits which will also flower so if I was just to give this potassium feed it would probably just grow one flower with this branch but with a continuous high nitrogen feed this will send out more side shoots which will then have their own flowers and even the side shoots of side shoots can have flowers you can have three or four side shoots potentially off one off, one off the other and having flowering so they can branch a huge amount but that really depends on the, on the genetics. Most branching varieties will probably only have one flower of each side shoot. So this one, for example, hasn't got good genetics for branching. It will have lots of side shoots. You can see them all growing here, but you can see they've all got those little bracts starting the form and not many leaves. So these ones won't actually be sending any more side shoots off their original side shoots. So it depends on the genetics. If it looks like they're just gonna have lots of leaves and not flowering soon, Keep with that nitrogen feed, we'll get even more size suits and we'll get an even bigger plant at the end of the year for it. So I'm now going to talk about a couple of the common pests that you might get at this time of year. Now fortunately the biggest pest which normally kills my sunflowers and I did lose a lot of my sunflowers this year because of it. In fact this plant should be about a third larger if it wasn't for the fact that all the other ones that I planted here were killed off by slugs and snails. So slugs and snails are the biggest problem for sunflowers but you're lucky at this time of year once the plant has got established they're not normally a big problem. The leaves are high up, the slugs and snails don't like getting out far from the ground because they dry out too quickly. Also the stems at this stage are normally quite hairy and prickly, which the slugs and snails don't like. So you're going to be pretty safe from slugs and snails for most of the summer. But there's a few other pests which you might get. Now generally sunflowers are mostly pest free and you don't need to worry too much about pests and diseases. But there's a couple of particularly bad ones that you might get. One of them is leaf miner. I've been lucky, I haven't really had much this year. I've only had one or two on some of my sunflower plants and as soon as you see it you need to take away those leaves. So I don't currently have any leaf miner on my sunflowers to show you but I do have a plant which has leaf miner which looks kind of similar. So what you'll find is you'll get these kind of lines starting to appear on the leaf. What will first appear like is like, it will be like this where it will just be a few little dots. The eggs will hatch, basically little grubs inside the leaves will start moving around and you'll get these trails and sometimes when you look from underneath you can get some dark sections and the dark sections are where the actual grub is. There's a couple of things you can do. You can either squish the grub with a fingernail if you can find it or remove the infected leaves. If you can get rid of the first generation in spring they normally aren't a big problem later on in the year but they can be quite devastating for some flowers are also one of the hardest things to deal with because they're in between the two layers of the, of the leaf the beneficial animals can't really find them and eat them like birds and, and other predatory insects so they are hard to deal with. You could go for a systemic pesticide which gets absorbed by the plant and goes inside the plant but I tend to do things organically so I like to just remove any infected leaves and hope for the best. So another pest that's worth mentioning is ants. Now a lot of people might think the ants are actually a pest and they're going to be causing a problem with the sunflower but the majority of the time they're actually helping the sunflower. So. Most people don't realise that sunflowers actually have a special beneficial relationship with ants. They produce these special nectaries that are outside of the, of the flowers. So they actually produce nectar from parts of their leaves. And what they do is they attract the ants onto the plants to come and collect that nectar. And in the process of collecting that nectar, they run up and down the stems of the, of the plant and they actually deal with any pests that the, the sunflower might have. So you can see this ant here, it's coming down and it's got quite a full ab abdomen at the back. That's because it's already collected some of that nectar. And what the, the ants do is they come up and down the, the plant and they it's normally around about here on the leaves. There's these extra little nectaries. So if you do see the ants craw crawling up and down the plant, don't worry, it's actually a beneficial thing. They'll be going up and down, searching for caterpillars and other insects that might be damaging the plant and they'll actually be looking after the sunflower. Now the only exception to this is if they're farming aphids. So sometimes you might find, especially on the young leaves and, and underneath the leaves, there might be aphids on the plant. Now aphids aren't normally such a big problem when it comes to sunflowers, but if you do see aphids and the ants are farming them, what you might want to do is just wash off the aphids with some water. But otherwise, if you see ants like these ones up here, and they're just working on the stems and there's no obvious aphids, then I wouldn't worry too much. That's the ants just feeding from the extra nectaries that the plants have on their leaves. 
and it's actually a beneficial relationship so it's actually a good sign for your plant. So the other pests you might get but aren't normally such a big issue are caterpillars. Here in the UK uh, caterpillars are probably not going to be a big problem. There's not a huge number of native caterpillars that like to eat sunflowers so if you do see them just pick them off but generally in the UK you won't have big issues and most of Europe as well. In America though where the sunflowers are native there's a lot more caterpillars which are going to naturally feed on this type of plant so you need to stay quite vigilant. Again just pick off any you can find or spray them with the soap solution or if you want to use pesticide you can use pesticide but I would say try and use it as natural as possible and just keep on top of them. One way to get rid of them at an early stage is to check underneath the leaves. If you see very small eggs they're normally uh, probably just a millimeter in size. Uh, cross any of the eggs before the caterpillars hatch and you can normally keep on top of it that way. Another pest you might often get is earwigs. They're not normally a massive problem for most of the sunflower's life but during the flowering stage they can come up into the plant and they can eat off all the flower petals so keep an eye out for them. You can maybe wash them out with, with a hose or something like that or use pesticide but they are a little bit more difficult to get rid of than some of the other pests. As I say, not normally a big problem but they can uh, take off all the petals at the flowering stage so you might have a, a nice plant growing for months, get into a nice size and then when it comes to flower you don't have any petals on it which can be really quite disappointing. And talking about petals, that's something that can get affected sometimes with the shorter varieties from slugs and snails if, you'd have a, if you have a wet summer because the leaves are quite tough, they don't tend to touch them later in the summer but occasionally the petals can get damaged by slugs and snails. Finally, vine weevils are another problem. I don't have any vine weevils here at the moment to show you but you'll notice they're damaged by seeing some little cuts along the edge of the leaves. That's a sore sign of vine weevils. They look like small beetles and although the damage on the leaves isn't too big a problem, the problem is if they put their eggs into the roots, the larva can eat all the roots off and the plant will be severely stunted and you often don't know why the plant's not growing well but it's actually fine weevils eating off the roots. So that's not normally a big problem outside, there's normally enough beneficial insects and predators to, to deal with those grubs in the ground, things like beetles will eat them, but if you are growing it in a pot, Vine weevils can be a real big issue and you might notice the plants not doing well. So one way to deal with that if it's in a pot is to either use nematodes as an organic solution, pesticide if you want to use pesticide, and to identify whether you've got it or not, if you carefully take your plant out of the pot, look around the root system. If it doesn't have many roots and if there's a lot of these white grubs in there, that's a sure sign that you've got vine weevils. So that's all for this video. I'll be making another one soon where I'll be looking at the end of season care and I'll also be making a specialist staking video. But this is what your sunflowers should be looking like now in the middle of summer. Loads of leaves and growing nicely and I'll give you guys an update of this at the very end of the summer as well just to show you how big my plant has grown. Now I'm not going to get as big as I could have gone in, in other years because I was delayed in spring by the slugs and snails damaging the plants. But looking at this, I'm still hoping for about four or five meters in height and we should be getting a lot of branching soon. You can see with branching varieties, they do tend to branch later. So you don't get a huge amount of branching until a bit later in the year. It does depend on the variety. Some branching varieties start branching almost as soon as the plant starts to grow. Other ones like this one, they branch a bit later and some don't really start branching until the first flowers have been cut off or the first flowers opened. And, and starting to die back and then they start side branching. So there's lots of different varieties and they all grow slightly differently. But if you want the biggest branching one possible, you want it to branch earlier and you want it to have side branches on its side branches.